Well, gosh, we are ready to get started again. These breaks go too quickly, don't they? But I hope that you're finding the, the day to be valuable and informative. And I'm so happy to introduce our next speaker, who just really seems to be a good soul. And we discovered that we both uh, went to the same grade school, but 300 years apart. So. <laughs> We have chalk in my day. <laughs> yeah, no, we did not have overheads. We had ditto, right? Ditto. So, so uh, Attorney General Mike Hilgers is with us today. He is the 33rd Attorney General for the state of Nebraska. As Attorney General, Mike works to keep Nebraskans and their families safe, protect their rights, ensure the integrity of our constitutional structure, help our law enforcement officials around the state, and protect our natural resources, including our water supply. Before taking office, Mike was an experienced pra private practice attorney, successful entrepreneur, and legislator. Mike was in private practice over 15 years, handling complex litigation and discovery disputes in state and federal court. After practicing in a large law firm, Mike founded his own litigation law firm. Mike built that firm from nothing into one of the fastest growing practices in the country. Before leaving his practice to take office as Nebraska's Attorney General, the firm had over 100 professionals and handled cases nationwide. Mike started his private practice after clerking for Judge Edith Clement on the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Mike graduated from the University of Chicago Law School, where he was an editor of the Law Review. Before taking office as Attorney General, Mike spent six years serving the people of Northwest Lincoln and Lancaster County in the Legislature District 21, serving his last two as the Speaker of the Nebraska <coughs> Legislature. In the Legislature, Mike introduced and passed a wide variety of legislation to help Nebraskans across the state from legislation to protect constitutional rights, to protecting our water, and to supporting law enforcement. So would you please join me in welcoming Attorney General Hunter. Thank you. All right, so I think I'm going to stand here. Does this work okay for yeah. everybody? Yes. Well, thank you for that warm introduction. It was so awesome to meet another Pius Panther here in Lincoln. Uh, you know, in Lincoln they think Pius is the high school, but you know, we know we know better. We right? know better. So, well, thank you so much for the uh, opportunity to be here. First, let me thank everyone who was involved in organizing this. Um, it is an honor to be here for me, in part because this work is so important. It's so important and it takes so many people to be successful. A lot of what we do in the Attorney General's office or what you do in life requires a team. Very few things can we all do ourselves, whether it's at home, a business, a community organization, a whatever problem we're trying to solve, it usually requires more than just one person. That is in particular, particularly true when it comes to elder justice and protecting, taking care of our most vulnerable citizens, in part because a lot of the issues that you might deal with, like in the Attorney General's office where there's a crime or there's a murder or something like that, there's always something that usually we can point to, we can investigate. But so much of what were the concerns and the threats that we see when it comes to our senior citizens are things that might be lurking a little bit in the shadows. And we also know that uh, there's so many different stakeholders that might interface or connect with senior citizens, whether it's financial institutions, whether it's um, social media companies, whether it's um, you know, uh, people at the Department of Health and Human Services, medical providers. We know there's all sorts of different folks that provide that have an interface and, and touch on, uh, connect with senior citizens that both provide opportunities for us to be able to help, be helpful and support them, um, but also prevent or create uh, opportunities, unfortunately, where they, they could be the victims of fraud or exploitation. So it's so important for this in particular, for people to come together and um, coordinate, communicate, share knowledge, uh, and really empower one another and let us know that we're not alone as we're trying to protect them and that they, they know that they're not alone. So it's a great honor for me to be here and to see this incredible roster of individuals who are speaking to you today. It's really pretty impressive and such, such, so valuable, really priceless in the work that we're trying to do. So thank you all, everyone, for pulling it together. So I know you're going to hear today or have heard. Yeah, I know you had a deep dive into uh, an actual case. I know you've, you're going to hear about um, you know, home equity, how we can protect the financial, uh, uh, help protect seniors from a financial perspective, financial exploitation, bless you. Um, 
what I would like to do is just talk a little bit about how our office fits within the gr greater team. Uh, I'm a big believer in teams. Sometimes in some plays you got to, uh, we're the offensive lineman. Sometimes I'm just the water boy. Uh, sometimes we can be the quarterback. And it's always important to know what your role is. And for us, we have a role. Uh, we're one of many people on the team. And I want to talk to you a little bit about our role uh, and how we fit within the team structure and how we want to help protect seniors in Nebraska. So big picture, we are focused largely on threats. And let me talk a little bit about how it's evolved so much. So if you are... If you are younger, the threats have evolved so much, no matter who you are, that it doesn't even look like it did 10 years ago or five years ago. I'm, I'm old enough to remember the Nigerian prince scams, right? I mean, you get an email, it's a Nigerian prince who wants to just give you $5 million, and just lucky you, you just happen to get it. Um, I also, uh, but today the threats have really evolved well past that, even in the last two years. So when I... As the doctor mentioned, before I became attorney general, I ran a, a large law firm. And we had over 100 lawyers. We did a lot of sophisticated work. And just the difference, say, from two, 2019 to 2022, before I left, just the sophistication on the way that lawyers could be exploited, exploded. You went from emails where the grammar and syntax would be very much, uh, wouldn't be very good English, you know, they would... Maybe they would send an email from my name, but it was very clearly, you know, they couldn't spell my name right. So you could spot all those things. When I left, the level of sophistication on phishing attacks, um, the way they could spoof email address, the way they could spoof phone calls, um, the way that they could um, actually get, hack in and get your two-factor authentication for your own cell phone. I mean, it was incredible. It was absolutely incredible. And now, even with AI, it's even gotten worse over the last 10 months. So put aside senior, not senior, or anything else, the sophistication of these threats have gone through the roof. So that's a, that's a huge concern um, for, for us and, and for those who are wanting to fight in this effort. And the, on the other hand, it feels like we have another trend that we're fighting against, which is a little bit of the atomization of society. I mean, it just, it feels like people are not as connected as they used to be. And that also is true for seniors and, and those who are not seniors. People tend to be more isolated. They tend to be more on their own. They tend to be less connected to family. Family tends to be, if they, to the extent they have family, people tend to be uh, in other areas, maybe they're in other states, you know? We're not all gathered around the kitchen table talking about our day and what's going on. At the same time, the sophistication of just our day-to-day -day transactions are different. You know, it used to be just 10 or 15 years ago, we would have just checkbooks. I mean, I, you know, maybe maybe 20 years ago, you know, you credit cards or being able to spoof a credit card number or being able to go online and pay your bill via PayPal, those kinds of things were almost unheard of 20 years. So you had a very narrow set of financial you know, ways that you could spend money, ways that you could transfer money, and there were far fewer, both far fewer threats and ways to spoof that, but also it was, it was more obvious for all individuals. Now we have complexity in every way. We have complexity in financial transactions, we have complexity in life and our relationships, um, and we have complexity in the way that people can kind of fool us. And so the threats are only growing no matter who you are. And it is especially true then for people who are a little bit less able overall to be able to maybe um, have familiarity with these types of threats, um, maybe be able to handle those types of threats, have, have resources to be able to talk to those type, to folks who might be able to help them. So it's really incumbent on us to be able to help step in where we can and help provide that information and try to help the uh, people who otherwise are being in a pretty difficult situation given the, the rising amount of threats. Now, I think it's a moral responsibility for all of us. You're in this room because you care. You're a stakeholder. You have some role in some way. You might be an investigator. You might work at DHHS. You might teach. You might connect in a nonprofit. All of that's important. It's also important for us as individuals to be able to communicate and watch out for and help empower those, whether they're in our own family or otherwise, to know the tools and resources that are available to them and to help encourage them and empower them to speak freely. Because one of the most important themes that I hope to empower or impart to, to this group and when I talk about this issue is we have to let seniors know they are not alone. They are not alone. And the cases that we see in our office oftentimes only get worse. They only compound because seniors feel like they are alone and they make decisions without being able to talk to people or get other resources. So we know, we know these threats are out there. We know it impacts a large amount of people. We know we have a, I believe we have a moral obligation, responsibility to support uh, our seniors in, uh, to help harden their ability to fight off these uh, exploitive attempts. And 
how do we fit in as a t in the team? Okay. So the Nebraska Attorney General's office, we do have a, we play a lot of we have a lot of different hats. Some of them, like uh, natural resources or fighting for our water rights, don't really apply to senior citizens uh, or these types of issues. But at least two of our bureaus do, and I want to spend a, a lot of time on one, which is the Consumer Protection Bureau, and a little bit of time on another, which is our Criminal Bureau, because not we're going to talk about some of these threats, but the, not all of these threats are sophisticated, overseas, Russian-based, Chinese-based foreign actors who are you know, hacking into people's email. You, know, you, you might have seen Congressman Baker just yesterday, or in the news today. Congressman Baker, former four-star general out of Omaha, he had his email hacked. Not everything is a foreign actor or someone. A lot of times, unfortunately, it's people closest to us or closest to seniors who can exploit them, but the, which is terrible in one sense, but at least they're here locally and we can do something about it if we know about it. So I will talk about a little bit of our criminal bureau. So our Consumer Protection Bureau is the primary vehicle uh, through which we help protect, ne protect Nebraska consumers, uh, truth in advertising. And we do that uh, we have on a lot of different fronts. But in this area, I want to focus on four things that we do. Um, this touches on a little bit outside of this bureau, but let me just touch on four. Um, the first is dispute resolution. And think about this as um, not just helping resolve issues like mediating disputes like you might have you know an actual true consumer issue where you know this this company didn't give me what i asked for and i think they defrauded me um also just helping people be a resource so we have an, a group called the consumer affairs response team cart for short cart for short it started about three years ago by my predecessor we have a group of dedicated individuals who ants basically work the lines um, I kind of think about it a little bit akin to a big constituent services group, maybe at a congressional office. They're constantly getting phone calls on passports and things like how they can help you mediate the federal government apparatus. For us, somewhat similar, except for us, now we can tell, we can help them on law enforcement. So CART is an incredible group. They take, we got about 5,000 calls a year into that group and they can, they can take all sorts of different things, uh, different types of calls, and it can lead to all sorts of different outcomes. So that someone might call, and there's nothing we can really do. Maybe it's, um, you know, maybe it's an issue that we have to refer to them to the local prosecutor. Or maybe it's not a criminal issue at all. Maybe it's something where it's like, well, it's just you're having a dispute with your neighbor, but it's you, you were not the right resource for you to use to help solve your problem. Sometimes it's we can get ahead of any particular issue. We might get a call from someone saying, hey, I just got someone on Facebook who sent me a message and said, uh, you know, we were, we were, it's like a catfishing attempt. You know, someone was, I uh, got this picture from this woman and I was, we were, we were Facebook messaging and I, we were kind of dating. And I never talked to her, but she needs like $20,000 for me. Can you help walk me through it? Those things, when we get upstream of the actual problem, that's where we can really be powerful in the car crew to help people before they do something. Sometimes it's all it's after that it's after something's happened, and we might not have any way to trace the dollars. Maybe, you know, maybe it's like Bitcoin. We've had examples where people have sent Bitcoin, which is not traceable. Often, not always, but often, those people who perpetra perpetrated the crime or the fraud are living overseas or some other state. There's fewer things that we can do, but we what we can do, but we can help, and we do help. Um, We've recovered dollars. I think close. I think in 2022 is close to a million dollars. That group was able to recover, and uh, it just gives people a confidential or a really a trusted voice of someone who understands what to look for, the patterns, and can be a great resource. So, if uh, so, if I'm going to impart another thing, it's uh, our cart number, which is 402 471 2682. 471 2682. So. Just keep that number in mind if you, part of it is in your own practices, in your own professional walk, uh, you, having that in the back of your, uh, in your back pocket, I think will help. If you ever need it, just tell them to call us. Um, at the same time, if you have a family member who needs help, they can, they can call us. Also, protectthegoodlife.nebraska.gov, protectthegoodlife.nebraska.gov. There are two T's in there, protect the TT. Um, that also has a, tr a lot of resources uh, to help people identifying fraud and, and making sure that they're protecting themselves. That's a, big, uh, that's a big part of what we can offer our customers, which are Nebraska citizens, and there's a lot of resources there that you can help and also pass along to seniors. So that's one. It sort of dovetails into two, number two, which is education. So much of what we do is education. It's educating uh, stakeholders like you're doing today on this particular meeting. Um, it's, it's really, you know, uh, 
educating the seniors themselves. It's educating um, uh, family members. It's educating you know bankers or bank tellers. It's educating other people who might interact with seniors for the signs of exploitation. All of that's really important. So for us, we want to do our part in helping to educate, and we have. Uh, one of our primary tools to educate is Ryan Sothan here to my right, who um, I was his understudy for him today. He usually does this presentation, <laughs> but I did pull rank and I said, I, I'm gonna, I want to talk uh, to this group. So he is our outreach coordinator, and Ryan does about 100, uh, 120 events uh, or, or uh, uh, presentations a year. 100 to 120 a year, he'll go to seniors, senior uh, living centers, assisted living centers. He'll speak to just about any group that you want to have spoken to. He'll go, we'll be out together at the State Fair in Grand Island in about a month or so, or a couple weeks. If there's any, so I gave you the number. I don't know Ryan's number, but if you're interested in getting Ryan to come and speak to one of your groups, Ryan's the guy. He's extremely knowledgeable on this, and he helps forward our mission of educating the public about the signs of fraud, how to protect yourself against fraud, what happens when fraud occurs, what your remedies are, and how you can protect yourself. Um, it's really important. Uh, so Ryan does a great job. And it's so important, to be, by the way, to be able to protect the other part of our senior citizens. We don't want anyone to be defrauded, but the people are just more vulnerable financially. If you think about sort of the end of your life or near the end of that stage of life, having, uh, you know, maybe you have more medical costs, maybe you're not working, you know, fixed income. Uh, I know in my legislative district, I met a lot of people who are basically like, look, I, I'm, I'm living paycheck to paycheck from Social Security, and this is all I got. And you know, if my property taxes go up or gas prices go up, I'm really squeezed. Well, some of those those people are the least likely to be able to afford any hit to their balance sheet, and they're less likely to be able to recover. Because if you're not already working and you and you you know you're you give away your life savings, your your out your ability to really recover from that and be able to uh, is really difficult. So. Um, that's that it's just sort of top of mind for us as we think about the moral obligation in my view for us to help protect and, and defend our seniors so education is the second one for us the third is enforcement so there's really two pieces of this there's a consumer side um, which I talked about the Consumer Protection Bureau so we can file civil lawsuits against people who, who engage in fraud so if someone says I'm gonna some Nebraskan as an example but, you know if they're in China, it's a little harder for us to reach them. But you know, if some Nebraskan decides to go to a senior citizen's house and say, you know, um, you know, we're gonna we're gonna do X, Y, or Z service, and we're gonna we're gonna you got to pay me some amount of money, and then I don't do the service. They might be actually criminally prosecuted. But if we can't show intent, sometimes it's hard criminally to show some of these things. We can bring civil suits. We can get injunctive relief. We can shut down bad actors uh, if they're in Nebraska. So our enforcement group in the Consumer Protect they're involved on a lot of these uh, local lawsuits. Um, they, we have investigators there, so CART sometimes will have, so Consumer Affairs Response Team will bring in complaints, and we might say, sometimes we say we can't do anything, but sometimes we say, oh gosh, this actually is a real issue. Let's give it to one of our investigators, work with one of our attorneys, and they can really dig in and find and see if there's anything that we can do about it. Um, we also have a criminal bureau. Criminal bureau is just what it says. We are involved with uh, bringing charges, persecuting, prosecuting people uh, for breaking the law. And here it's really, you know, we talk a lot about, at least we do, and at least I do, when I think about the office, I think a lot of the online scams, which is certainly prevalent and rising in both volume and magnitude, but we don't also, we can't also forget the ones that happen locally. And these are ones that really are almost more tragic because you might have someone who has been named a guardian, um, someone who is a conservator, who is able to control the assets of someone who... Uh, who is senior and they have a trusted relationship with that person and they abuse that trusted relationship. We, unfortunately, it seems like every year, two, three articles a year, where someone will get prosecuted for something like that. Those are really tragic because they really abuse a, a, tr a trusted relationship, which is really unfortunate. That's an area that, we can, that our office can get involved in, especially if it's further out west where there are fewer prosecutorial resources. So enforcement is a big thing that we do. Um, so as you think about Especially if you're not in Douglas or Sarpy County, they've got or Lancaster, they've got a lot of prosecutorial resources. Those counties are well staffed. So generally speaking, if there's fraud or something like that, we could bring charges in those counties, but we tend not to because they we tend to defer to the local county attorneys. But if you're west or north, if you're in Madison County, if you're you know in Colfax County, if you're further west in Cherry County or Hooker County, and something like that happens, 
our office oftentimes is the go-to. We have the investigatory resources, we have the prosecutorial resources, uh, we have the ability to bring in people to be able to prosecute these crimes. So as you think about your, your, what you're doing and who you're interfacing with and you see these kinds of things, think about us from an enforcement perspective, especially when we're west of, west of Lincoln. Um, the last one I would emphasize for us is legislatively. So this is not maybe a traditional purview of the Attorney General's office, but it is something that is a passion of mine because I served in the legislature and I served as speaker and it's such an important role that we play to be able to help get good legislation passed and good policy and, and get the tools in the hands of those who can wield them to do really positive things, whether it's this context or others. So being a former speaker, being in the legislature for six years, we've invested a lot of resources to get uh, the right minds together and the right relationships so that we can get things passed. We did that actually when I, my first year as speaker, LB 297, was a bill that did, I um, can't remember the precise title, but it helped uh, give financial institutions and enabled them and empowered them to be able to delay some transactions if they thought there was some uh, fraud going on. Um, it's a little bit of a challenge on some of these because on the one hand you want to give them tools to shut things down. On the other hand, seniors just like everyone else are human beings with free agent with agency and liberty and you can't just say, well we're we're really worried about you so we're not gonna you know we're not gonna just let you just participate in commerce like everyone else. Um, and that's a balance. It's a challenge. I think we were able to uh, achieve that balance in the legislature in 2021 when we passed that bill, LB 297. There's a lot more to do there. Um, I certainly wouldn't suggest that our office has all the answers, but what, the way we approach this issue, any, any other, is by listening, uh, having humility, and really trying to work ground up to find out what the right solutions are and the problems that we can help solve. And so I would just, I would uh, be explicit and sort of empower you to, if you have something that you're seeing that you think that could be that that could be resolved, or or something that you think could be implemented to help actually uh, all of our collective efforts in fighting uh, this type these types of uh, criminal activity and protecting our seniors. Let us know. Let us know. We we are thinking through long term strategic plans on how to get the policy in the right place so that we can our work will be will be more impactful and we can do more for seniors. So that's really the fourth one is legislatively from our perspective. There's other things that we can do, uh, but we try to stay in our lane. We try to be, you know, we can't be everything on every issue and you all are the experts on your own particular lane. So all we want to do is empower you where we can. We want to uh, try to stop the bad guys where we can. We want to educate others, including this group, our communities, our families, seniors. We want to educate, educate them uh, and really just, um, you know, try to do what uh, our part and try to just, um, you know, incrementally improve and improve the situation and protect seniors. So um, that's really, I don't know, I think I had 45 minutes, which is far longer than I should speak, and I hope I stayed under 20, doctor, but I think I'm close. Uh, you're doing well. Okay, so I'm going to stop there, uh, but I understand we've got some extra time, so if there's an issue or questions or anything you might want to dialogue as a group, I'm happy to dive in. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so if we did have ideas on a legislative bill or something like that, who within the Attorney General's office would you contact? Because we, we had some good brainstorming here today that I think would be beneficial. Uh, oh, that's awesome. I yes. love that. Okay, who's the keeper of the pen on the brainstorming first? Well, right here. Okay. <laughs> okay. Can you go out and for 10 minutes write down all the ideas? And, oh my gosh, uh, okay. Okay, so, um, like, I don't, who, who would the contact be, I guess? Probably the best person, uh, I'm trying to think of who the best, so I don't have an external face to email. So Josh Sachere, which is a hard name, easy name to say, but hard to spell. But Suzanne Gage is here with on our team, and uh, she runs the CART team. So if you send it to Suzanne, <coughs> that would be great. Oh, thank you. Uh, that's awesome. All right. That's just music my ears. Yes, ma'am. Uh, just a simple question. So the CART team, if they do get a call of something that they think, hey, this should be investigated, potentially prosecuted, but it's from somebody in Douglas or Sarpy County, do they then refer that on to those county prosecutors, or how does that work? You don't. It, you don't have to go to the pro county prosecutor. Usually, so in my experience, we would. Our prosecutors could look at something and yeah. say, "Oh gosh, there is something here," and then kick it off. But say, "Hey, you should really talk to Douglas," or we would call Douglas or Sarpy. Okay. So I think the cart uh, 
you know, I don't know, if, Suzanne, if you could speak to any broadly any patterns in the Cart Group if you've told them to to say just go to Douglas or Lancaster. But in my experience, if it's another issue, it would just roll up to our prosecutors and then we'd analyze it and then maybe hand it off or not. Can you speak to that? Yeah. Sorry we, to put you on the spot. No, so. that's fine. We actually take calls from across the United States. We primarily serve Nebraskans, um, but there are businesses in Nebraska that are bad actors and we feel that we want to be as helpful when our begin with allows us to do that. Mm -hmm. But it, it's so unique, each one is so unique as far as what the need is, what the request is. And we really are an intake point for the office, a communications point for the office. So um, we can't really direct people, we take information. Um, you can do a complaint that's online and that's received in a database that's shared with the investigators and the prosecutors, so it's sort of a global assist. Thank you. And, and Suzanne really runs the CAR team. She's hired the folks. She's trained them. They're outstanding. They're really good people. They've got just a really high EQ and treat people the right way. So mm -hmm. people should feel very comfortable, you know, calling. Kind of like a tele, you know, an inbound marketer who's just like, you know, can't listen to what you're asking for. I don't know. Uh, has anyone called like a T-Mobile? I don't mean to pick on T-Mobile, but I feel like <laughs> just lately I've been on the phone a lot with those marketers and I can't get anywhere. So thanks. Any other questions? Well, I just wonder, Suzanne, would you be willing to share your contact information sure. with um, not only with the folks here that are live, but also those are, that are streaming? I can be reached through the number that he provided, but okay. absolutely. My, actually, my number is on every press release, <laughs> okay. so it's the most um, accessible one in the office. It's online. It's online. Yep. All right. And is it G-A-G-E? G-A-G-E. Very good. Yep. Thank you. Pardon me. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank Any you. other topics, questions, or thoughts? Thank you. Who's after me? Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, good. So, no, we, we're doing well. We're doing well. Good on top. Okay. Yeah, we're great on time. You know, in, in your new role, and we're so glad you're in this role, what do you see when you when you think about the future, and particularly as Nebraska's population is aging, what are some priorities in your mind in terms of how we can better serve Nebraskans, older Nebraskans, through your office? Oh wow, that's a gr that's a really good question. I mean, a lot of it is just to, it's really ground up policy changes. I think. Okay. And we have a really good our car group's outstanding, and I think. We'll, we can, everyone can always get better. I can get better tomorrow than I am today, and I'm going to try to do that. So no one, there's no such thing as being perfect. We're always going to get better. We have a great car crew. We're going to try to get better at that. But I think we, feel a, we do a really good job on the prosecution consumer side with the information that we have. So, um, so I think it's finding some of these. I think where a lot of the um, sort of like a lot of hard work is going to be is really is some of these policy changes. And maybe some of these change. We have so many uh, large, and I don't mean this pejoratively, but large bureaucratic entities that interface with seniors, and it's easy to get lost. I Man, I make this contrast a lot with the difficulty with fishing or something with a younger person. It's true with the bureaucracy. It's hard enough for a younger person to deal with bureaucracy. So how do we how do we empower, train our bureaucratic institutions to be to be more responsive, more you know, more adept? educated to see the signs, how do we give them the legislative tools or take off handcuffs where necessary for them to be able to be empowered to act on that information. Um, I think those are probably the, some of the biggest things that would, that would come within our agency. I don't know if there's from a tool, so one, one uh, thing that you would initially think about would be tools to go fight the crime. So for instance, like some states on some issues don't have the actual statutory authority to go prosecute certain um, and there are examples of that in Nebraska where the last 10 years we said, well, okay, this, you know, um, there's a certain type of social media based crime and we'll give this state attorney general, county prosecutors, those types of authority. I don't think that's the case. I don't think that's a glaring issue for us. I think we have a lot of those tools. It's, um, it's more on the education and then really within these, these bureaucratic structures, I think, to help, um, to help uh, our seniors be able to navigate those worlds a little better. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Do you see any trends in types of issues that seniors are dealing with that have risen in the past five years? Oh, I think by far, this is probably true across the board, but I think by far it's online scams and spoofing. 
um, you know, people, people, someone will call and it'll be the IRS. They'll say it's the IRS. I mean, they, what they prey on is fear of share, you know, privacy, fear of sharing. You know, we have examples where someone will be called and like, oh, you know, somehow. I mean, this is facially, you might think it's like ridiculous. Someone will call and say, oh, you know, you got to give us money because you, there's a child sex assault or child pornography investigation and you got, you got entrapped, you know. And there's a very trusting nature, with, I think, a lot of Nebraskans. You, someone calls them, and you're like, oh, gosh. But then it's about an issue that you don't want to call up someone and say, hey, I might have been entrapped in a child porn investigation. You know, like, so they prey on these issues that by, by sort of putting people into isolation so that they don't share and get resources. So it is, I think, by far, it's using these technological online devices, whether it's spoofing, phishing, phone call-based things. It's pretty bad. It's pretty bad. I think that's by far the, the, the most. Just get off the internet, everybody. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's something to be said. Yeah. Right? yeah. Back when we were pious. Yeah, back yeah. Were, yeah. We, <laughs> that was not an issue. Yeah, that's right. That's How right. do you trace chalk? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I might have missed this, but does the CART team help with like advocacy for, let's say, somebody's Medicare number got stolen or they gave it out to somebody? Like, do you guys help that? individual with Medicare, like dealing with them or anything like that, or um, not so directly? that's a federal agency, that would be, I don't think that would be something that okay. we would normally, correct me, Suzanne, if that would be incorrect. There, we refer people to their appropriate agency, like, um, to make sure that they get the resources. Okay. For example, we just, or we refer the agency, for example, we had an intake of some complaints against a state agency, we don't um, resolve against agencies, but we said these people have these concerns, and then they take they take <coughs> meeting those needs. Okay. Um, we have a question from yeah, online. Our web. Here. Yep. Said that uh, we heard Adult Protective Services and Department of Revenue say they shared information from their investigations with local law enforcement. Uh, does the Atter Attorney General's office typically reach out to other agencies when investigating crimes against seniors? Um, so if we get, it's a good question. So if we, we're appropriate, we, we work with our, our law enforcement sister agencies all the time, whether it's in Douglas County, uh, the Sheriff, or <coughs> Omaha P Police Department. So we will where appropriate, it's very context specific. We certainly, we've got great relationships with them, so if we need to, we will. Um, Oftentimes you don't have to, you know, but we, we certainly have open lines of communication when necessary. It's a good question. Uh, it usually works the other way. Local law enforcement calls us because we have tend to have the resources, um, you know, both more prosecutors, financial resources, investigators, things like that. So more often we get a county that will call us and say, hey, can you take this one versus the other way around. It's a good question. All right. Any other questions? All right. Attorney General, this has been wonderful. Oh, thank, thank you, you so, so much. Thank you so much.